All right. It looks like we got a bunch of people still jumping on, but uh, for the uh, sake of time, why don't we get started here? <clears throat> so, uh, hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Brian Hesterman with Inspire, and I'll be hosting today's webinar and Q&A session. Uh, as we learn in part one, growing cannabis inside a sealed room is a highly complex interdisciplinary challenge that bridges engineering with biology. A plant is not just a biological organism. It is also a physical object that is subject to the same physical laws that govern matter, such as the law of conservation of energy. As such, energy in indoor plant environments is neither created nor destroyed, but rather converted from one form to another. For example, when light is provided to a plant, a small amount of that energy is absorbed by the plant's leaves for photosynthesis, and much of that energy gets converted into evaporation. So how do we maintain an optimal water balance and manage plant evaporation to ensure production outputs and quality are maximized while lowering costs of production through efficiency and reductions in labor? The answer to that question is, it depends. Every project is different in a multitude of ways. There is no one size fits all approach and there's no single manufacturer that can build the right system for every project. Today's presentation is part two of our two part series and will be focused on the engineering side of the equation, the system and how control is achieved. We'll cover general HVAC system considerations, HVAC system types and components, and we'll touch on design and implementation if we have time. This will be new content for some and review for others. And the goal is to provide a solid, a solid foundation of important environmental control requirements that should be considered and how Inspire can help your project with a diverse lineup of purpose-built HVAC systems and controls. Okay, just to quickly set the stage for the presentation, this talk will focus on environmental control uh, for indoor cultivation only, not greenhouses. Uh, while many of today's concepts still apply to greenhouses, greenhouse environmental control strategies are for another talk. Um, we're also dealing with sealed grow rooms where we have complete control over all growth parameters. Um, there's no outdoor air in normal operation and the air within the room is fully recirculating. Uh, and, and that's mainly because we're supplementing the air of CO2 to maximize carbon assimilation and the growth rate of the plant. Um, these sealed rooms can be either single level or multi-tier. Uh, and the focus of today is, is on cannabis, but uh, a lot of the core concepts that we cover today can also apply to any other crop that is grown indoors. Um, all right, a couple quick housekeeping items uh, for today's session. You can find the Q&A section at the top of the webinar screen. Uh, please ask questions as they come up and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Uh, today's webinar will also be recorded and uploaded to YouTube so you can rewatch later. Uh, today's webinar will be presented by Inspire's Adrian Giovanco uh, and Inspire's lead applications engineer and product specialist Joji Singh will be joining for Q&A after the presentation. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Adrian. Take it away, AG. Thanks, Brian. Welcome, everybody. Great to see you all. Thanks for joining today. We've got a lot to cover, so we're going to jump right in. This is part two, the system. I'm going to drop off camera for this portion to save bandwidth, but we'll bump, come back on for the Q&A. So our primary objective is to design, sell, and commission mechanical systems that serve indoor plant environments and allow for optimum plant performance, secondary metabolite production, and long-term profitability. These facilities are true manufacturing factories that produce high quality food, recreational products, and medicine on an industrial scale. With homage paid to a book that we draw inspiration from called Plant Empowerment, we view our role as supporting plant balances, not controlling air conditions. The real art of good growing is to support the plant in maintaining its balances in such a way that all factors for growth are optimal at the same time. We're here to build on our part one webinar where we broke down all the needs of cultivation and curing spaces. And as we've shared, we must not do this in a vacuum, which is why everything we do here needs to be squarely focused on all the important plant focused topics that we covered in part one. With this solid foundation, let's spend some time exploring the process by which the most appropriate mechanical systems are sized, selected and controlled to serve these cultivation and curing rooms. 
Based on what we learned in part one, the mechanical systems need to have the ability to do all of the things shown on the slide in each room. Dehumidify, cool, heat, humidify, enrich with CO2, clean the air, distribute the air for homogeneous air environment, and most importantly, collect cultivation room level data so that we know what is working, what needs attention, and how we can use feedback from the plants to optimize production. So can one system do all these things in an integrated fashion, or do you need separate pieces of equipment? Let's dig into that. For decades, HVAC equipment has been designed to keep humans comfortable, thus the term comfort cooling systems. Subsequently, specialized process and manufacturing environments developed to require specific environments. Since people feel temperature more than humidity, and since we generate heat, the majority of HVAC systems are designed to cool only. Additionally, most process environments produce a lot of heat, think data centers. So these process-oriented solutions also tend to be more sensible cooling centric. Indoor plant environments are special in the sense that they have living and breathing organisms that happen to be immobile. So consistent ratios of temperature and light on a day-to-day -day basis is key to performance. And while you may not feel it in a forest, plants are giving off virtually all of the moisture that their roots uptake. Each plant or tree is an evaporative cooler. This dehumidification heavy load is a big reason why the mechanical systems that serve them must be specialized. On top of the large moisture removal requirement, these rooms also have a very dynamic load profile between lights on and lights off periods and the beginning stages of vegetative growth to the end of the flowering cycle. For the flowering cycles, which dominate the facility space needs in these facilities, the load completely flips 180 degrees every 12 hours. Now, there's a concept from part one that's worth repeating. And much like the law of minimum for plant growth, the productivity of an indoor cultivation facility is determined by its greatest limiting factor or its most underperforming system. In our experience, the greatest limiting factor for most indoor facilities today is their mechanical systems or their ability to control the temperature and humidity of their rooms. The improvement of mechanical systems presents the greatest opportunity to maximize the productivity for indoor cultivation businesses. And this is exactly why Inspire was founded, to develop and deliver purpose-built systems and controls that are assets and valuable tools for growers and not a liability. Now on the next slide, let's explore some of the specific differences between the two types of facilities and systems, comfort cooling HVAC and HVAC and dehumidification systems meant for indoor plant environments. So on the left side, you'll see attributes for the HVAC systems for comfort cooling and on the right for indoor plant environments. This whole conversation starts with the need for both temperature and humidity control, also viewed through the lens of VPD, rather than just temperature control only. As such, plant-centric sequence of operations are required to respond to the needs of the living organisms whose needs are constantly changing and to manage the rest of the items on this list. Sensible heat ratios are very different. 50-50 cooling and dehumidification versus 85 or 90 percent and 10 to 15 percent dehumidification, and which requires airflow and the coils to be sized appropriately. We have high number of air changes in the sense of how these spaces view air changes. These are 100 percent recirculating systems, but we are changing out the air every two to three minutes in a 20 to 30 air changes per hour rate versus two to three air changes per hour. Now, this is a very dynamic load between day and night, and that requires variable capacity control, both on cooling, reheat, airflow, where fixed capacity is okay in many cases otherwise. And reheat is required in order to deliver room neutral air conditions and keep the plants in conditions optimal for growth. When we eliminate dehumidifiers, we're needing to reheat that air back up whereas in comfort cooling applications, you can deliver much colder air. And in this case, CO2 is plant food and costs money to introduce. Thus, air economizers are typically not applicable. Biofiltration and air cleaning is extremely important and must be included. The state laws differ, but universally strict lab testing requirements and lack of ability to use pesticides on this crop because it is ingested can lead to large crop loss resulting from pests and pathogens. Like everything in this unique application, the whole process is interconnected. 
by creating a culture of clean and improving the cleanliness of the air environment within effective biofiltration systems, you can reduce or eliminate preventative sprays and the labor costs associated with them. So now that we know what functions are required and how the needs differ from typical comfort cooling to process cooling systems, let's take an important sanity check with regards to the cultivation business needs. So with the complex and multidisciplinary challenge that we are faced with as an environmental, as environmental system architects, so to speak, designers and builders, and with so many different types of system variations to consider, we must base our decision-making process on the most important factors first. Key performance indicators or KPIs are used to set the baseline targets and they must be continuously tracked starting from the first cycle. We like to recommend using the second flower cycle as the true test of the benchmarks that were set since it is very challenging to load test these spaces and commission them properly with plants and real load before bringing in your, your first run and starting to cultivate. So we suggest for our clients to really try to simulate that load in the space as best as possible during the commissioning process, but it's not always practical. What the, of these attributes do cultivation businesses need to succeed? We regularly poll cultivators and cannabis business owners, and out of this long list, the attributes that come back on the top of the list are quality, consistency, speed to market, lowest operating cost, safety. On the point of reduced cost of production, it is very important to not forget about building efficiency into your facility from the start and taking advantage of CapEx offsets from the utility or state to help improve efficiency and reduce cost of production. This is where indoor and vertical farming industry can truly participate in the triple bottom line concept that sustainable facility design can be good for business, good for the environment, and good for the consumers. So let's spend a couple of minutes digging into these details around efficiency and incentives for offsets. Dehumidification is an energy intensive process. The HVAC dehumidification systems can comprise up to 50 to 60% of the total facility energy consumption. And as that's rolled up, that total energy accounts for 20 to 40% of your operating costs. The HVAC portion of the energy accounts for your total, total of 20 to 40% of your total operating costs, costs in a cultivation facility. And investing in efficient HVAC and dehumidification systems lowers your operating costs per pound in perpetuity. Efficient systems are what you need to weather the storm of price compression and supply and demand imbalances, which are guaranteed to happen as state markets mature. Most existing facilities today are not built to make it through these challenges. By investing upfront, you can keep your costs down. Don't expose yourself to these risks by doing it right the first time. The utility and tax incentive programs offer free money and are only getting better. Custom rebates are available now in all states. Prescriptive rebates are coming in many geographies. Peak demand reduction incentives are very significant right now in California for the next year and in a number of other states. This could be as simple as scheduling your light cycles outside of the peak demand hours or implementing controls retrofits. Combined heat and power or CHP systems can gain both tax incentives and utility rebates for the same project, which is a real win-win. And we see more and more cultivation facilities taking advantage of CHP systems as they can, in many cases, be the most financially viable solution to get a project financed and built within a reasonable timeline. Plus, we get all of our reheat for free. Now, utility incentive programs are developing fast to so stay apprised of programs in your area and connect with the utility providers early. Now, let's not forget and we don't design efficiency into the overall system just for the sake of efficiency. We must focus on the plant productivity first and then find ways to do it efficiently. And a little foreshadowing of for what's to come today, but since we embrace an integrated design approach from the pre-construction stage, we actually can do both of those successfully. Now that we've got all the business level needs ranked, we have to make sure that those track with, you know, uh, mixing in sustainability and efficiency and the KPIs and all of that uh, we just discussed, we have to make sure that that is all going to jive with the system considerations that the owner and client are looking for. 
and the building and site design constraints, which you see system considerations on the left and can design constraints on the right. Capital costs and operating costs are extremely important. You got to get it right the first time. HVAC is typically the largest capital investment on a project, and it is also one of the most expensive to retrofit. And there are really so many different competing factors here, whether you go through level of control, efficiency, sustainability, like we just discussed, the reliability, durability, complexity, maintenance requirements, who's going to maintain it, how is your phasing set up for future phases and build out, um, and are you focused on GMP cleanliness standards? All of that has to be transitioned into how we're actually going to apply this into this particular building or site. And these design constraints are what the engineers, MEP engineers and architects and other design professionals have to work with them. These that you see on the screen are some of the, the items that we see most often overlooked. Space and structural limitations. Do you have enough utility? Power, gas are the biggest. Water is also very important. CO2 availability. Property line and neighbor complaints, both odor control and noise related, can sink a project. Biofiltration and pest pollen exclusion needs to be considered and very, very, very seriously in areas that are agri agriculturally dense. Um, and the controls, integration, air distribution, uniformity, how we're putting the facility together, all take space. Now, all of these items have to be able to meet the building and energy code compliance as well. So this is a really multi multidisciplinary challenge. And it's been said before, but it's worth repeating that it's imperative to get this done right the first time because of how costly and challenging it is to retrofit the HVAC systems. So let's start looking at some different types of systems that are used commonly in cultivation facilities. The first place to start here is with what we call non-integrated systems. There, these can also be called conventional, non-integrated, decoupled, or legacy systems. Now, during prohibition, cultivators were forced indoors to hide from law enforcement. And due to that illegality, they could not engage engineers or commercial HVAC system providers or HVAC technicians to design and install mechanical systems to control these spaces properly. And this really led to a do-it-yourself mentality and propensity for using what was available. And specifically, we're talking about off-the-shelf residential people comfort cooling systems used in conjunction with standalone dehumidifiers and oscillating wall fans. All of this gear can be bought at a local hydro shop or Home Depot. For the cooling equipment, it can be packaged rooftop units, split systems, mini splits, VRF systems, or two-pipe chill water fan coils. All these systems are cooling devices and control off of a thermostat only. Standalone dehumidifiers are required then to augment these HVAC units. And they're heating only based on rejecting the heat of compression from the dehumidifier into the space. And the AC units now have to be sized appropriately to remove this heat rejected by the dehumidifier, which is roughly 30% additional. So several issues persist with this type of system configuration. Suboptimal control and this relative humidity spike at lights off every night where powdery mildew and botrytis can develop. It, we see uncontrolled microclimates and uneven airflow and poor air mixing in these spaces. They're inherently inefficient based on that 30% extra heat load to remove from the dehumidifiers, as I mentioned. And these systems are really fighting against each other because it's challenging to control. There's pathogen risks with this type of design since your technicians will be working on the mechanical equipment above the canopy, as you see in the picture. And condensate leaks are routinely dripping into the plants, which is a common uh, opportunity for water molds. Sanitation between the cycles is also very challenging to achieve since there's so much equipment in the room and so many surfaces to clean. So these, these all challenges really beg the question, can we do it better? You know, as experienced HVAC engineers, we know that we have the technology to do it better. So why wouldn't we? Some say that the first cost savings and many small redundant units are worth the trade-off. The data tells us otherwise, and the industry is maturing too quickly to not take advantage of today's technologies. Let's get into how we can mitigate these challenges and hit the mark with the owner requirements for their business operational efficiency 
we discussed earlier and make it a high performance and sustainable system. Now, quickly before we move past non-integrated systems for the rest of the presentation, I do wanna mention that for the hundreds and thousands of rooms across North America that are already built with these systems, HVAC controls retrofits and sub canopy airflow systems may be some of the best ways to get reliable data and better control from these existing systems and to be able to apply a plant-centric sequence of operations, put together an action plan to supplement additional capacity if the systems are undersized and utilize open source architecture for control systems to be able to integrate into future retrofits of the full HVAC systems um, as additional capital becomes available. These controls and airflow retrofits can often be supported by the utility rebate programs that we touched on, which really helps to offset those investment costs further and improves the, the ROIs. So with, now let's dig into integrated systems. Here we graduate to what we term integrated HVAC and dehumidification systems, or HVACD, which highlights the importance of dehumidification in this process. We see these also being called reheat systems based on the use of hot gas reheat. In that case, the heat is recovered off the compressor that would have been sent out to the condenser to be rejected to ambient. And this is a DX or direct expansion system. We'll go into those in more depth in a moment. Hydronic systems are another type of integrated system, but we must be specific with our language and naming conventions. Four pipe hydronic system versus a two pipe hydronic system, which is integrated a four pipe and two pipe is a cooling only supporting a non-integrated system. We'll get into more of this in a moment. As HVAC engineering professionals, we know that a well-engineered system is the best solution when faced with such a multifaceted design and construction challenge. A properly designed integrated system provides cooling, heating, and dehumidification in a single engineered system. Since all of this is happening in integrated air handling units, we can treat all the air in each room for pests and pathogens on a continuous basis and keep the grow room clean with no foreign materials to clean. Remember that airs are being exchanged every two to three minutes. With an integrated system, we get the benefits of a tightly controlled and homogeneous air environment with controlled transitions between photo periods. We get to pick up inherent efficiency gains in the 30 to 40% range compared to non-integrated systems by removing standalone dehumidifiers. We focus on the systems being right-sized and reusing energy and water in any way possible. It really sounds too good to be true, right? But we can balance all these spinning plates with a simple and elegant system design. First, I thought it would be good to quickly examine two rooms from a recent client side-by-side -side study. This is an example of an integrated HVAC system on the top left versus a conventional non-integrated system on the bottom right and what the control trends look like. This is two different flower rooms, both in week four using LED lights, both in a two-tier racking system the same week in June of last year at the same facility. Note the relative humidity spikes of 15 to 20% every time the lights go out, which is a critical transition point in these dynamic spaces. The relative humidity line is the purple line in the trend on the bottom right. And you can see much tighter control of relative humidity through these transitions and with the integrated system. Note the speed to the control points or how quickly set points can be achieved. But the most important part of this whole story is that the one on the bottom right was getting 28 grams a square foot of sellable flour, and the one on the top left is getting 55 grams a square foot consistently. We've got double the yields with integrated environmental control. Now let's go from here to talk about the different types of integrated systems that we deploy as a comprehensive solutions provider. This type of system is called DX, which stands for direct expansion. This is the type of home air conditioner you likely have. It contains the full refrigeration circuit in each unit or system. This can be a split system or a packaged unit. It can come in an air-cooled variety with an air-cooled condenser or a water-cooled condenser. And in general, air-cooled DX is the most common system that we see today due to lower first cost, technician familiarity, and shorter lead times. 
However, we see it transitioning to hydraulic systems and will continue to transition more as the market matures into true manufacturing facilities at scale that need to prove they manufactured their products at facilities that can be validated by regulatory bodies. We advocate for our clients to be ready to meet GMPs if they did so desire from the minute they turn on their facility, and we, we enable them to do that. We offer our Canopy, Canopy Plus, and Preservation product lines in both air-cooled and water-cooled DX systems to meet our clients' diverse needs. And you can see a few different form factors installed in these pictures from left to right, DX package unit on the left to a water-cooled energy recovery system in the middle to an air-cooled DX split system on the top right. And remember, these are all integrated systems, but just in different flavors. So now let's look at the other type, hydronic systems. The terminology here, like I mentioned before, is really important. These are called chilled water or hot water systems or hydronic systems, or you hear the terms four pipe or two pipe thrown around. What you see in the diagram on the top right is four pipes, where you have, in this case, you have six pipes because it's a water-cooled chiller, but on the load side to the air handling units, you have four pipes, two for cooling, two for heating, chilled water and hot water. A two-pipe system is only gonna provide you one or the other at a time. So that would be in, more in the non-integrated camp where a four pipe system would allow you to do integrated control. Now these chillers and the chiller plants can be air cooled or they can be water cooled. They can be electrically driven or they can be gas driven. And heat recovery is available on all of these types of chillers, which means we don't need to pay money or use resources for reheat. These systems are very customizable to meet your site needs as far as space considerations and phasing and better precision control is available via modulating water valves, which really allow for infinite variable capacity control. Optimization opportunities exist for sizing an overall system um, and for your facility because you can size your plant based on the block load of your facility rather than the peak load, which allows you to shave 20 to 30% of the total capacity off of the plant. There's an opportunity for phasing, particularly with modular chillers and pumps, which allows for additional redundancy as well as you build out your plant. We typically see these systems being chosen when the total facility size reaches maybe 300 to 400 tons total. Now I want you to take note of the gas-fired chiller on the bottom of the slide with a partner of ours called TicoGen. This animal uses natural gas to produce chilled water with no middleman, and business owners that proactively understand their utility rate structure and the relative costs of electricity, gas, and water in comparison to each other can make the best financial decisions. And many times those projects end up including a gas-fired chiller plant. So let's compare and contrast what we just learned about these two types of systems quickly, both integrated but different. On the left, we have the attributes related to DX systems and the hydronic systems are on the right. We talked about the individual DX circuits per room and per unit and the many distributed DX circuits to maintain versus consolidation and fewer at a chiller plant. We talked about good control versus precise control. We talked about uh, redundancy and how it can be applied where a direct expansion on a room by room unit basis, you would need an additional unit on every single room rather than building in redundancy into the chiller plant. And we do have a lower first cost for direct expansion systems, but the return on investment breaks even really at about 15 to 20,000 square feet of canopy and facilities of any size larger should always be looking at hydronic systems. Both systems required skilled mechanical technicians to maintain, and both systems need engaged and experienced design and construction and maintenance teams. Uh, this is not just something for one type of system or the other. Again, you're only as good as your weakest link. So don't let that be your HVAC system or your HVAC service company. You know, retain on a service side, retain a yearly contract with your service company so that they can handle pr routine preventative maintenance and be available for emergencies at the best rate and can prioritize availability. 
So what are the ways? So are, what are, are these the only real ways? You know, we talked about these two different main types of systems. Uh, are there other ways that we can meet this challenge? It's important to talk about, you know, there are other proven technologies out there. Um, it's, there's no free lunch, though, right? And there's, there's trade-offs with all of these. At Inspire, we pride ourselves in a brand agnostic approach that specializes in finding the right system and HVAC and controls system for each project. It requires continuous improvement and innovation. So we're always evaluating all types of technologies to determine what our clients can benefit most from. But technologies need to be more than a great idea or conceptual opportunity for efficiency or other benefits. In order to be commercialized and used on these facilities, we must be sure that they're proven for this special application of indoor plant environments and that they can be cost effective, serviceable, reliable. Safe to say we're very picky about what we implement in the field. and Our clients look to us to be their subject matter experts, gatekeepers and sort of a safety net. We only look to support new innovations when we can see positive results in third party verification and see the systems run in person. With that said, there are several proven dehumidification technologies on the market that we have found to offer varying levels of opportunity for sustainable and high performance design. All four of the types of energy recovery devices shown on this slide have a similar efficiency improvement over baseline, but all have unique pros and cons. After careful consideration and field trials, our Canopy Plus line utilizes the water-to-water -water runaround coil concept to recover warm room air, which pre-cools the dehumidification coil and then subsequently reheats the air off the coil as the first stage of reheat. This results in increased efficiency for the system of 30 to 50% over brute force cooling and tighter control with both air-cooled DX, water-cooled DX, or four-pipe hydronic system options. The biggest word of caution with any new technology is the mandate that you see it in real life and can truly validate the performance and claims with third-party data. Speaking of third-party testing data, I thought this would be a good transition into one of the places where we see a lot of snake oil in the cannabis industry. And honestly, the whole HVAC industry now that we've just lived through a pandemic, and that is in air cleaning devices. I'd like to share the technology we trust for our plant environments. What you see here is a photocatalytic oxidative air cleaner, or PCO for short. This air cleaning panel reduces the risk of pests and pathogen contamination and failing lab tests. Since cultivators must pass third-party quality assurance testing and provide COAs along with their sellable product, it's imperative to monitor and regulate the relatively high particulate pest pathogen VOC loads within these spaces. Particulate capture filters of MERV 1314 range will typically catch particles size one micron and larger. And we don't, don't forget to actually change those filters on a regular basis or hire a service contractor to change them on a schedule. But PCO air cleaners are the primary active biofiltration solution that we incorporate in our systems in conjunction with those passive filters. These can be in-room units or in-duct systems or in-unit systems. And typically duct mounted is chosen since we're already bringing all the air through these systems and the ducting system every two to three minutes. Third party testing data and validation is required for all air cleaning technology to be considered. And in addition to the recirculating units serving cultivation and curing spaces, we can apply this air cleaning technology into separate supply and exhaust fan filter units that are used to introduce clean outdoor air or purge gases and handle odor control, rebalance the gas mixture of air in the sealed room, or use it as an economizer sequence if the outside air conditions may be available. Uh, or we, one, one spot we see this most effectively used in is, is in an emergency mode to be able to bring in outside air as a backup for any mechanical system failures that need time to repair. So we offer all these different ancillary items with our integrated systems, as well as a la carte. Now, speaking about subcanopy air, air moving devices, I, I wanted to talk about airflow and air movement. When discussing airflow in a cultivation or curing room, we must consider all air moving devices serving the space as a complete system, even if they're not physically connected. In an integrated system, the main air handler or air handlers are used to condition and circulate air as a component of a heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system. 
The air handler connects to ductwork that in turn distributes the conditioned cool dry air throughout the grow space before it returns to the air handling unit. The movement of air through an indoor grow space is imperative to maintaining a healthy garden. Without proper airflow, plants may not be able to evaporate water at optimal levels, stunting photosynthesis and carbon assimil assimilation. Furthermore, areas of high humidity are prone to pest infestation, mold, or mildew. So our goal is to create homogeneous airflow throughout the entire grow space. Fortunately, we can't solely rely on the HVAC system for the in-room airflow, since we're designing that system based on maximum moisture removal as a means of making the system as cost-effective as possible. However, great care consideration should be taken when designing the supply air and return air duct configurations within room layout and in-room airflow devices because the room performance depends on it. The ductwork approaches and design differ between single tier and multi-tier rooms. Sub canopy airflow systems must be used in multi-tier gardens. You can see a CFD modeling of the sub canopy system that we offer in the middle of the page. Top canopy air movement devices should also be considered. Unit performance depends on a good ductwork design and installation and in-room airflow devices that are designed together for optimal performance. And we've seen many, many different rooms in operation and can help provide suggestions for best practices in an over-the-shoulder type fashion in collaboration with the mechanical engineers when we become engaged in projects and equipment has been purchased. The CFD models in the middle of the screen show one such design concept that we support. And in this scenario, we're introducing the supply air into the working aisle on the right-hand side and sending it down the racks with sub-canopy airflow fans and tubes for the return air grills to pick up at the other end of each tier and return the air to the air handling units. We typically see rack lengths of less than 40 feet being best for reducing microclimates and dedicated return air grills locations for each tier rack really help bring move the air through the room. So with so many different permutations of system configurations and ancillary items to integrate, how do we know that the room operation will be consistent? Well, the answer is with accurate data collection to inform the plant-centric controls and sequence of operations. And we've, we've discussed throughout the presentation today, typical factory control sequence are not applicable to this industry as they're designed for people comfort. We require specialized sequence of operations for cannabis and other indoor plant environments. It has taken us aggregating and optimizing the control strategies over the past six plus years with a multidisciplinary task force comprised of plant physiologists, controls engineers, HVAC engineers, crop scientists, biologists, and the many channel partners who serve the space to develop what we believe to be the first true plant-centric sequence of operation available today in the industry. Today, we implement this standardized controller with embedded sequence of operation on all of our air handlers, both hydronic and DX. And these can also be deployed in a retrofit solution for non-integrated systems or onto existing integrated air handlers for lower cost retrofits. All the sensor data is collected with multiple aspirated sensor boxes per tier and located within the plant canopy. This data is aggregated in our controllers and connected throughout the facility with a simple ethernet based LAN, which connects the field devices and allows for control based, sorry, cloud based control, monitoring and alarming. And the sequence of op optimization strategies are many. Intelligent set point ramping, smooth transitions, speed of change, negative and positive temperature differentials, cold air dumps, gas composition resets, room pressurization control. We've really only scratched the surface with crop steering techniques that can be implemented through the plant's environment. And back to an important concept from part one, genotype or genetics plus environment equals phenotype. Everyone is after the next hot pheno. Environmental control is a fundamental building block to grow better cannabis and to do it more efficiently. It is the critical first step in a comprehensive integrated pest management program that reduces pathogen pressure and labor expenditure. Integrated control is the best form of crop insurance. You really only have one chance to do it right. 
It could be the difference between building long-term asset value and going bankrupt, frankly. The industry is really on a knife's edge. Competition is increasing, prices are plummeting, margins are shrinking, and you can't afford to do it wrong. You can't afford not to spend the money on environmental control. This is why Inspire focuses exclusively on indoor plant environments. Our team's passionate plant and engineering intimacy combined with a diverse lineup of purpose-built environmental control solutions helps ensure your cultivation environment is not your limiting factor. I'd like to take this moment to thank the individuals and companies who are helping the industry grow better crops. Lighting providers providing the necessary photons, automated fertigation companies that have allowed us to fine tune dry backs and mineral balance, racking providers that optimize room utilization, data collection, monitoring and control systems that allow us to see the impact of precision control in real time, the education and media partners for sharing knowledge to the industry on the challenges of day-to-day -day cultivation, the genetics providers that develop great cultivars, and the multidisciplinary consultants that help bring entrepreneurs' visions to life. We talk a lot about integration of temperature, humidity, and CO2, but it's the integration and understanding of all of these people, partners, and systems that make cannabis businesses successful. And with that, let's open it up for some questions. Ryan? All right, thanks, Adrian. Lots of good info there. Uh, looks like we uh, ran a little bit longer than expected, um, but we've got about 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, we've got a few here, uh, but please uh, feel free to use the Q&A button at the top of the webinar screen to ask uh, some additional questions. And if we don't get to them to, uh, today, um, more than happy to follow up direct at any time to uh, dive deeper into any questions that, that you have. Uh, so let's see. I want to start with a question here um, about, well, actually, let's first introduce Joji. Hey, Joji. Can you, hey guys, can you hear hi. us? Yes, sir. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Awesome. Hey, I just want to uh, give a shout out to everybody that took their time to join us today for the webinar and, you know, took their time to listen to us. I'm pretty excited for what H had to share and excited to continue with this Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. Well, welcome, welcome to Inspire's webinars. I think this is the first time we've had you. Yeah, uh, it's great, great to see your face here. So, I've got a question here. Uh, I think that should be directed to you, Joji. How do outdoor conditions and geography impact unit selection and performance? Yeah, that's a great question because outdoor environments play a big factor in not just determining what style of units we kind of consider for the job, but also what components we're going to select for the job. And, you know, this comes, this becomes really important in environments and geographies with extreme weather conditions. So, for example, let's take the Northeast um, as an example. Northeast, as we know, during winter times, they can go below freezing. And then during the summers, they can go above 90, sometimes even up close to the hundreds. And so we have to determine, do we have the right components to actually handle those extreme condition swings and have an operational units because if you don't have the right components selected for such swings, you're going to see a drop in your performance for the system and then a drop in environmental control for your rooms. So making yeah. sure, yeah. That's makes makes sense. I think I, we've even seen units just stop working, right? And when it gets to low low ambient temperatures and even and, and very and performance that suffers terribly exactly. at, at the high side right yeah 100 percent. and i'm sure like as a lot of the listeners probably know like keeping the right sort of pressure and temperatures throughout the systems is extremely important and that becomes very suspect to i guess dropping off during these low ambient and high ambient conditions and so being able to kind of predict that and combat that beforehand when you're doing your unit selection is extremely important. That's great. Thanks. Adrian, you have anything else to share on that subject? Should we move on? Uh, yeah, I think we can move on. Sounds good. All right. Uh, let's see. Got another one here. Uh, what are some of the 
gotchas you've run into coming into projects early versus late? And I think I'll direct that one to Adrian. Yeah, I tried to try to pepper a couple of them in there throughout. Um, you know, um, there, there's there's a lot that we run into. You know, it, 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 we could we could talk about um, we could talk about operational and and maintenance and things like that. I threw out the like, hey, make sure you change your filters routinely. Um, we we find that to be something that that happens. You know that doesn't happen on in a routine basis enough, and and that, that can really impact your performance. Um, we, we see, you know, on more on the design side, if, if, if we're sort of looking at it from that perspective, um, we see scope gaps um, really rampant um, b between different uh, providers of systems, and um, I think really effectively maybe not taking advantage of the. Um, construction management and general contractor um, trade that that exists really for that reason to to truly try to eliminate scope gaps on projects as early as possible um, because those, those professionals are out there and exist and would do wonders on helping to keep a project on time and on budget and avoid um, unnecessary really and, and very very costly and challenging change orders that end up happening um, we see many facilities that don't have enough power. That's that's one right off the bat, um, and it can be you know it depends on where you're where you're at. Some utilities say great, we'll have it for you in a couple of months. Others say great, we'll have it for you in a couple of years. Um, and you know what what's your financial situation like at that particular site or building over those couple of year period that you're waiting for the utility to bring you that power? And it's one of the other reasons that we see um, combined heat and power plant facilities. Um, being, you know, being or combined heat and power uh, systems being utilized at these types of facilities more often because you may have gas available where you don't have electricity. Um, and structural limitations and deficiencies is, is another huge one. I mean, you know, I think we recently had a project, you know, it was a $6 million project and they found out that they were going to have to make $2 million of structural upgrades to be able to make the project work. And they said, well, sorry, you know, that's not, that's not going to work for us. So let's, let's go find a different, different building and facility. And, and that all that money was down the drain up front. So those are just a couple that, that come to mind. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Joe, do you have anything else to add there? Any, any? Yeah, I think one that really, yeah, one that really stood out to me was just, um, you know, facilities that kind of utilize their overall um, square footage, like their plot square footage for the building, and then they're limited on how much clearance they have for the units, like alongside the building. We've seen that kind of come up a bit that people sometimes overlook. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, and also add issues lots of issues around sizing the hvac systems as well around the, the latent and sensible the reheat the supplemental heat whether or not to use humidification at early stage flower right there's a there's a transition from veg to flower where the humidity conditions change and you can shock the plants or you can or in early stage flower you don't have enough humidity coming off of the plants, enough evaporation coming off of the plants to um, give the units sufficient load. So you, I think Adrian and Joe, you guys could talk more specific about this, but um, being able to uh, just, just accommodating the life cycle of the plants and going from room to room, there are lots of considerations that need to be made as well. Yeah. Yeah. High level, you just, you need to be able to pr provision for humidifiers in your flowering spaces in order in order to, to do that VPD match from, from veg over to flower. Um, and, and another one that I, I, I neglected to mention, I just, just thought of was um, the importance of tight room construction, right? Everything that we've talked about here about environmental control can only be done if you have tight room construction and we're not losing air into external environments, either through the, you know, the, the construction of the room itself um, or through the ductwork, you know, joining the air handling unit systems to the, to the room itself. That's a good point. I think, yeah, the, the assumption with all, all of this is that you've got good construction. And if you've got infiltrations and exfiltrations of heat or moisture or CO2 or whatever else, then the performance of your 
room and your facility is going to suffer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see another one here uh, related to the conventional non-integrated stuff. Is it possible to get good control of the environment with mini splits and dehumidifiers? Uh, Joji, why don't I toss that one to you? Yeah, man, that's, that's actually a great question, especially, you know, where the current space and how a lot of our current facilities are set up. You know, alone, these units can definitely provide moderate control to their local environments. Yeah, and when I say local, I mean the square footage that you usually see on these specification sheets. You know, they kind of think of, you can kind of think of it like a hemisphere. Each individual standalone or mini split is controlling their own hemisphere rather than controlling the room as a whole. So inherently, that's where I guess the lack of performance comes from is they're not truly integrated and they're controlling for their own con um, local environments. Whereas integrated systems, they see the unit, I mean, the room as a whole and are controlling accordingly to that. Now, you know, one thing that I want to say is a lot of our, our customers or customers in the space that have this system already in place, when I say system, I'm talking about like mini splits and dehumidifiers, there is possibility to get that integrated control after the fact with a controls retrofit with a more plan centric sequence of operation to integrate all those individual units as one. So you're kind of making that, you know, a bunch of little random um, split systems, dehumidifiers and integrating them into one whole package. Now it's not as great as a truly integrated package system or a hydronic system would be, but it's definitely that next step up between the two. I hope I answer that <laughs> to you guys. Yeah, yeah, I think that was uh, that was great. And there's there's a there's a comment or a question in the chat. I think that it's it's somewhat maybe somewhat tangentially related to this. That it might be good to 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 address, um, which is how long does the humidity spike last in that non-integrated system, and were all the other parameters held constant between the integrated system such that the difference in yield can be attributed? Um, it, I mean, for, first off. Um, well, so the, the the short answer is yes, we did everything that we possibly could to make those two rooms side by side as, um, the, as you know, really keep that as the only control variable um, between them. Inherently, there there may be some other um, noise in that, no doubt. Um, there there's so many differences that go on. E even even on a p on a plan when you design a facility with eight identical flower rooms, and then you go and you build that facility, and you think that you've built them all identically, um, you'll end up with with some small changes and and differences between all those rooms too. So it, it's very, first off, it just is very challenging to do that in general. Um, but um, the other piece of it is we would love to do more science, truly scientific research and um, have the ability to be very, very certain about these types of types of situations. Um, unfortunately, there's, there's not much money and propensity for it in the cannabis space presently um, based on the illegality of it federally and, and how the funding sources for, for universities work that have that have controlled environment agriculture and indoor plant environment type programs uh, we were at a conference last week where there's a lot of these folks um, speaking and presenting research and things and it, it is starting to loosen up um, little by little and, and hopefully we're, we're going to make good progress here over the next year or two in, in that in the hopes of really being able to do true testing one side one to the other um, but in specific to the to the first part of that question um, that humidity spike lasts for about an hour typically um, it can be, you know, one to two hours is, is what we normally see in those situations. Um, and we can we can definitely answer more detailed questions on that uh, further offline, if you like. Yeah, lots of structural challenges with growing cannabis, particularly on the federal level. But uh, congratulations to Maryland and uh, Missouri for uh, voting in rec last night. Yeah, uh, 20, 20, 20 total states now have legalized recreational uh, for adult use for above 21. And, I, you know, we're, we're definitely at the critical mass in, in, in this country, and you, you can see it really internationally as well. So I, I hope that that really starts to, to, uh, um, to open up money for, uh, for more, uh, more, more research and development. 
Yep. Yep. For now, we, uh, we're all doing as much as we possibly can. Yeah. Uh, so and there's another see. good one. You want me to take yeah. th this Please. one in the chat, I think is good. Um, do you run into building department jurisdictions that push for providing, um, outside air as part of, in this case, title 24, which is a California energy code requirement, or do they typically treat the rooms as process rooms and allow for the hundred percent recirculation? Um, so th this actually is going to be specifically, um, specifically addressed in the code change that's coming in less than two months in January, 2023, um, the, um, CEA in general, indoor plant environments will become a covered process under California title 24 energy code, uh, which I think is, will be the first time in the, across the country that this process load will actually be required to be covered, um, in, in the energy code. Um, and, Pre previously up until now we've just been c calling it a process room um, and having an exemption for the economizers uh, from the current code but with this becoming a covered process there are some other stipulations that you need to meet around um, reusing and or utilizing um, uh, waste heat and uh, basically trying to minimize the amount of reheat energy that's used of new energy um, and as a result of it becoming a covered process, they're now, they're understanding this sort of, you know, nuance that goes against the code, the way California's code is set up. And so there, there is an, an exemption for economizers written in to this new code language to allow you to not have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, just to um, kind of add to that age, the heat requirement or the reheat requirement is 75% of your annual annual usage should come from on-site heat recovered methods. Yeah, yeah, and and the the comment from Jason is 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 great because you know there's 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 other potential reasons to use outside air in cultivation spaces um which in his his comment was that you need you can use some outside air to purge ethylene which is a, a gaseous hormone which accumulates in sealed plant environment so uh, that's another place where uh, we'd love to see more uh, research and development um to to really help inform the way that these systems are, are constructed we have the ability to bring in outside air and we treat all that air um, so it's really just more about, you know, when should we do it? Why should we do it? How often should we do it? That sort of a thing. Yeah, that's great. Hopefully that helped answer some of those questions. Um, we're, we're up uh, on the hour right now. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that I dropped a few useful links in the chat. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, you can use the free consultation link. Uh, if anyone has project data they'd like to submit and work on uh, an, an equipment quote and selections, you can submit your project data using the second link. And then our resource page uh, is a page on our website that we're really proud of. We've dropped a lot of uh, a lot of information on what we've learned over the last five to six years, and. Uh, Lots of good resources there to to brush up on both plant related and engineering related material as it relates to CEA, which by the way stands for Controlled Environment Agriculture. If anybody was wondering, so I guess I want to be mindful of, of, of everybody's time, and I think maybe we should cap it off right now. But uh, if anybody has any follow up questions, please feel free to get in touch with us. We're available anytime. Always love to talk and really appreciate everybody spending time with us today. That's just great. Great to see everybody. Thank you all for the time and uh, see you soon. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Take care. Bye, guys.